<laughs> John, you'd been, you'd been telling the stories to the children, but um, when did you start to visualize Donald and Benoit? Because oh, Benoit looks uncannily like, well, I mean, he's got ginger hair and so on, but um, he dresses like a wee matelot, and you uh, have been known to dress yourself like a matelot on occasion. Uh, accidentally, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, accidentally the matelot. Uh, Maybe that's the title for the autobiography, huh? The accidental matelot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I never, and, and Jackie mentioned an autobiography which I've never written. Uh, I think I started it was called. Well, we uh, did. A, we actually did a book festival session about this bi autobiography, which did not exist. <laughs> did <laughs> it exist <laughs> way, you know. Yeah. Uh, I eventually did it in pictures, but and it was going to be Jamie Bing that did it uh, for Kanye, and he said, could you write some text for it? And I went, no, why? Why would I write text? Uh, the drawings were self-explanatory. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to tell him to anything, <laughs> really, you know, even though I'd spilled the beans to Jackie, you know. I think once you've, uh, so many people say they're going to make a film or going to write a book and then they tell you all about it and of course it never appears because they've let the cat out of the bag. And fortunately I did they do that with us. But can we go back to the, the Donald and Benoit and when you started uh, to visualise them? Uh, I think we went on a holiday to France. We were going to uh, find uh, the little town. In fact, I, I, I tracked it down where Monsieur Hula's holiday was made. San Marc sur Mer, which is in uh, either Brittany or Normandy, I couldn't tell you. It's, it's, anyway, uh, I arranged it all as a surprise and I, I booked uh, tickets to, plane tickets to Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been a travel agent. <laughs> and then we, I went to hire a van from uh, <laughs> Bordeaux. And I said, we were arriving about uh, 10 o'clock. I think it's, it's some little, oh, I don't know how many kilometres it's away. It's like, it's a couple of hundred miles from, <laughs> from San Marc sur Mer. So I was driving about 150 kilometres an hour just trying to get us there. And uh, eventually it did, and it was delightful. And that's where the, the sort of idea, because they, they bought, uh, the children, we ones were about, oh God, they were about three or four. And we bought them a comic one day. Uh, and there was, there was a, wee, a wee boy in it. Uh, who wore a sort of school cap called Benoit, I liked the name. And it was Benoit, the strongest boy in the world, in French. And uh, so I, got, I took the name, I thieved the name from uh, that comic. But it was a comic, a picture comic book. And uh, made him a different guy altogether, slightly older. So did you, did you then paint them, the, the, how they looked? Uh, did you create paintings of them? No, I'm not. Initially, I, mm -hmm. I didn't know, but I knew what they looked like. Uh -huh. I knew exactly uh -huh. what they looked like. No, and then everybody went off to, a few years later, everybody went off to uh, Oregon. Was it Oregon? I like Portland to make a film. This was and when said, they went behind. with their mother, Tilda Swinton, to, I, to make a film. Uh -huh. And they all went off, and I stayed behind, and I did uh, ten big drawings, ten portrait drawings of people. I made them six it for hours and hours and hours and, and also did the book but that was the only version one of the book you know and it went through four versions so like four or five years later it was ready and then I wasted another so it's a, a long time in coming out but it's worth it in the end. You say John in the beginning there have been four versions of the book is that also because you have an American publisher? Well in a I suppose in Did a way... Did they want to rewrite thing, you to rewrite things? Cause not that much. I did, I did cut out the, the double doors. They don't like smoking, for instance. Smoking. They, were, they were all smokers. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, what they used to do, they were, they were about this height, you know, all the devil dogs, one, one foot four. And uh, uh, before they started dancing, they would they one, they'd go in the shop lift a miniature of bells from the licensed grocers. <laughs> They'd all have a nip of the miniature, and then you started, you know, and you can't hear uh, devil dogs drinking or smoking <laughs> in America. And you can't say stuff like blood. Uh, one, of the, one of the devil dogs has got distemper, so he's down, one man down, 
And so that's the way, oh no, I'm going to spoil it for you. No, but there's, a, there's a vacancy for a, a dancing devil dog. There's 18 dancing devil dogs. The left is 17 because the story I think is against the temper. And this is to dance. And they're going to be dancing at the Electric Hill Cinema. Oh God, what was I going to tell you about then? Um, uh, oh God. What, what did you ask me, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a convoluted. It was such a convoluted tale. I asked you Briefly. how the Americans were about certain oh, aspects right, right. of so political they have an correctness. Saying, uh, the, the devil dogs are, are looking for fresh, fresh blood to join the troop, and you can't say you have to go fresh talent. <laughs> Not the same, fresh blood. That's a, that's a well-known phrase of saying. Which brings me round to no, I won't, I won't go on about it. But anyway, uh, yeah, I had to uh, sort of massage bits of it, but they were so nice. They were such a nice uh, publisher, <laughs> and so keen to do it. It's much shorter than the normal story that would be told to the uh, my younger children then, and uh, it's still a good read. Um, how do they how do they feel about their story being out there? Because in a way, you've stolen their story from them, haven't you? I stole them, them, I stole their, 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 their life savings have stolen it in the past. <laughs> but uh, no, they, initially they went, oh, they couldn't quite understand because they were still they were about ten, mm -hmm. and uh, they couldn't quite grasp that. And uh, then, but I saw them the other day, and they are so delighted that that they have uh, they're sharing it with. The entire world. Well. Now, is this going to be a series? Well, the, the publishers, the two publishers, the two publishing guys, uh, Anthony and uh, Rob, were saying, and and in the next uh, uh, book, I mean, what next book? So they they think they're, you know, and and Rob, who was a children's editor, and Anthony runs the, the whole thing in uh, New York, the whole uh, office in New York. And Rob said to me one day, do you think the Americans will, will call him Benoit? <laughs> I said, possibly. <laughs> so uh, I think in America it's Donald and Benoit, you know. It's, it's quite a thing, isn't it, to become um, a first-time children's author, if you'll forgive me, at the age of 71? 102. <laughs> oh, correction, 102. But, it's, oh, it's just, it's, it's, it's all, uh, things happen when you get older. Mm -hmm. It's even better than uh, getting them younger, that would spoil you, uh, totally. I'm so glad uh, that uh, it's been published now rather than, you know, when I was 25 or 30 or 40 or whatever. Because that's when you first wanted to write a children's book, wasn't it? When, when was you left I Glasgow School of Art? Was 19, that? I think I was 19 when I thought, oh God, I'd love to write a children's book. <laughs> Sometimes walking along uh, Socky Hall Street, I think it was. I have to mention it to somebody and they just kept walking. <laughs> But so it's it's nicer if you uh, have to wait a while. Were Hopefully there wait. any bedtime stories in your childhood? Uh, which I've already referred to I a little. Okay, there were some bed, bedtime dramas, but <laughs> um, story. I don't think there were stories as such, but there was there were stories. There were plenty of stories. When we used to go to my grandmother's uh, in Cardonald, she lives in Cardonald, and uh, her and my uh, grandfather, the McShanes, uh, had to elope from Ireland because my grandmother was 16 and you couldn't get married in Ireland at that time when you were 16, but so they came to Scotland. They were forced to come to Scotland. And uh, there was always stories going down. Uh, there was Monk Ohlone, he was also from Ireland, and his son, young Oney. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my uncle Pat was a bookie, uh, who was my mother's brother, in Govan. And uh, he was a great storyteller. And he was in the RAF during the war uh, in Burma. And he used to write me letters. Uh, he used to write, well, he, he would write my mother letters, you know, like sort of cablegrams, and there were little cartoons in them. And uh, I thought, oh, God, I've got a brilliant. Or he is, my uncle Pat, it's just totally brilliant. And it was <laughs> years later, I discovered you could uh, buy these ready made. The cartoons were on it in blank paper. <laughs> <laughs> but he never let on that it wasn't him. <h <Hoe> <laughs> so I got a talent, my talent from my uncle Pat, it's okay. Uh, the drawing talent. 
I referred to the, the drama of your childhood. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because you, it, it, your mother was quite ill. Uh, well, she was, but I mean, that was, I used to, uh, when she was, they used to, used to get the old uh, doctor crying, who was the family doctor, to come over. They had to rouse him, I had to get the police to rouse him from his bed. And uh, he'd come sort of drugged up to the eyeballs and then uh, eventually gave my mother an injection. So she was taken into the psychiatric hospital as a voluntary patient. <laughs> Unconscious. <laughs> so a voluntary patient. No, it was, it was pretty hellish for her. Health. And uh, of course, uh, I went through periods of thinking, this is just wonderful in one way. One part of my brain was thinking, oh God, this is, this is without thinking I'm going to turn anything into a play at all. Mm -hmm. It was just very dramatic, you know, because you would get the phone and she would run in, out in the street. I remember one time she put her fist through it. A neighbour was looking out her scullery window like that. And she hated, she never let on she hated this woman until she ran up the street uh, in her night clothes and put her, saw the woman at her window and went <laughs> and punched her right through the window, broke and cut all her arms off. So if that wasn't really dramatic, I don't know what it was. But there's all sorts of things. Going on. Um, so everyone knows that drama. But you always knew, the strange thing was you'd come home from school and there'd be a bird got into the house. A stray bird had come down, the flown down the chimney or whatever. There were no birds in Fergusley Park. I promise you, you never ever saw a bird. And there was like a harbinger of doom and you just went, oh, there was a certain atmosphere. And you knew there was going to be a, a period of uh, psychosis or whatever it was. And uh, on her death certificate it said, uh, Dementia Precox, which made Phil say, and Phil McCann and the boy say, when he was at his mother's grave, say, ah, it was Dementia uh, Precox and top of the flu. <laughs> Do you think that, that all of this drama that surrounded you, you said you, you're kind of watching it and thinking that's interesting. It well, was, I, it I, was I, I reveled in the fact that it was dramatic. I didn't, mm -hmm. I hated it. Mm -hmm. The things you're forced to put up with or in a situation that I would never, now, now you would think if you had a choice, you didn't have any choice. You know, if I had a choice, I would have, they would have shown me around Fergus with the partner as I said, I don't think so. I think I'll maybe go to uh, Ralston or somewhere. And I don't know if you know Paisley at all, but Ralston was a horse end and Fergus Park was a, the undesirables. They're not getting, going to get in from the horse end at all. That's, that's with all the drama and all the stuff and all the material that you're, you're ever going to need uh, is. And the same thing with going to school and we're all... Uh, the twins go to a Steiner school in Forest. And I went to St. Bernard's Academy and uh, uh, Renfrew, because it was the only secondary school in Paisley. It was a Catholic, a whole of Renfrewshire, a Catholic secondary school. And it was junior secondary and senior secondary. And these guys were, you know, you saw guys of 14 wearing men's suits, double-breasted suits and stuff. And uh, been told, I think uh, there was one was uh, shot dead in a, a brothel in uh, Leopoldville, a guy in our class. Another one was in the street battle in Blackpool, and this is many years ago, and was shot in the, his, his face, head blown off with a double barrel shotgun, Wally Vesey. Wow. I mean, it's just, uh, that, that school you wouldn't have wanted to send your children to, you know, unless you wanted to be, grow up as an artist of some description. <laughs> 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 and there was always somebody getting bopped through your, I'm seeing the heads, there wasn't a head in front of there was those palings, you know. And all was, oh, it was, it was a never-ending enjoyment, it was thrilling, it really was. And that's where all the talent's coming from. <laughs>